especially for the stimulus funds, not simply to come back as they must and tell us what we've done wrong, but with the hope that the IG would work with the agencies to keep them from making mistakes that might otherwise be available, uh, sorry, inevitable, uh, it, it, given the speed, the breakneck speed that they've been ordered uh, to proceed. So could you tell us ha how you are proceeding? Uh, are, in what way are you working with, even given your auditing function? Um, it's not unheard of for the auditors uh, to um, look before something goes out. Uh, it happens all the time in one of my other committees. Uh, how are you operating so as to minimize uh, the issues that arise when you get out funds this quickly? I'd be glad to, uh, Congresswoman Norton. Um, in my testimony, I mentioned the work we do uh, on our contract attestations. And contract attestations, we look at the uh, contract proposals or claims submitted by contractors, and we look at the pricing of that to make sure that uh, uh, the pricing they have is supported and reasonable. Now, do um, you have the standard? These are you, yours. Uh, are you? Are you? Um, you, of course, are, are are working with WMATA. Yes. Is WMATA the only agency you're working with? Yes, I'm the WMATA IG. Well. Uh, and and, and, and you you 're in better shape than some of our i g s who are working with lots of different kinds of money going out at the same time uh, to different parts. Um, are you able before the fact to um, look at the, the 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 contracting dollars and uh, other proposed uh, ways of operating so as uh, given the time frames they 're under? We currently do that now. Uh, I think in my testimony I mentioned that since I've been there in, the, uh, in May 2007, we have reviewed it, contracts uh, yeah, with see, proposed Yeah, the value. problem we have here is a move it or lose it problem. So this is not like what you usually have. It, it's if this money isn't used, and if I were running an agency, I'd try to get that stuff out there as quickly as I could rather than have it move away. So I, I'm, what I'm trying to, 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 to ascertain is whether we have something different from what we've had before where the government did not put these kind of time frames on local agencies in the past. Perhaps we should have, but we did not. So what have you done that is different about people who are under orders, as it were, to get this out and, and make jobs now? We have... Um... Do you have the staff to do it? I certainly could use more resources to do it. I think you're hurt. Well, you're not going to get more resources. So I want to know, given the fact that these people are under a breakneck, you know, after 128, 120 days, it's gone. Given the staff you have uh, uh, and, and the fact that this money, what is it, runs out within is it a year and a half, um, the, 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 the issue is obligation. Yes. That's what the issue is. Within a competitive system, which means that we said go shovel ready, are you finding that, that they are going with things that have already gone through a sufficient, is the WMATA going with uh, um, uh, projects that have already gone through sufficient clearances so they're ready to go into the ground except for letting the contract? WMATA has identified the capital projects that they would like to fund using the stimulus money. We have that schedule. We have also sat down with the director of procurement at WMATA, and we informed him that as soon as you're ready, let us know so that we can do the necessary contract attestations. We will give those our highest priority. We also uh, do contact have, have uh, attestations. Been, have any of those occurred yet? Excuse me. Uh, we have we have not received any as of as of uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, I informed him. Uh, we do. See, is the money been released? No, I don't think the money's been released. Uh, they so have the money advertised for WMATA, the, one, the stimulus money for WMATA is not in hand. I, I don't think they have award contracts yet. 
No, I'm just asking if we, we the federal government, have dumped it on WMATA yet. Uh, WMATA has applied to the Federal Transit Administration. For, there are two grants uh, that FTA will award to WMATA uh, with our funds, uh, uh, Congressman Norton. And one of the grants is in, has been submitted to FTA. It's complete. The other one is uh, in process right now. And the total so wait a minute. So we're going to count it from when? Uh, the moment the test is for, for federal transit funds, 50 percent of the funds uh, in the D.C. urbanized area have to be obligated, awarded in a grant from FTA to Metro by September 1st, 2009. It's a different test than for federal highway funds. And uh, my understanding is that uh, WMATA plans to have uh, 80 percent of its federal transit economic recovery funds obligated by that September 1st deadline. Now, wait a minute. So you have to make a decision first? These are, these are formula funds, and uh, WMATA has put together uh, the list of activities it plans to apply for and has submitted that information to FTA. And the, there are So the time begins to run from? Uh, the, well, the clock, the clock began running uh, when the law was enacted, and the law said by September 1st, 2009, uh, the 50 percent of the funds have to be obligated. I guess that's because the nature of the beast here. That's correct. It's a little different from highways. Yes. And so WMATA has to uh, turn in information to FTA. Uh, so what, what kinds of things need to happen. do they have to obligate for under uh, this? WMATA has a number grants. of activities that they are going to use their ARA funds for, which include uh, new bus purchases. Uh, they're going to replace some of the platforms at metro station, rail stations, which are crumbling. Uh, they plan to purchase some paratransit vehicles. Uh, there's some track maintenance There's a equipment. lot of difference uh, among those things. And, and Indeed. And, and it is... You know, it is some of those things, you know, it seems to me that they could be already in operation, like repairing uh, the, the station. Um, so that's an ordinary highway job. Right. The, the economic recovery funds uh, approximately double uh, the federal funding for WMATA during this period during 2009, for example. So but apparently none of it's yet out. Is that, does it all go out at one time? I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to, the whole point was to make jobs, make them there. Some of those, we have to contract to buy buses. Yes. That, that's a long timeline. Where you've got to take a station and, it's and, and, and where the passengers stand is crumbling, why, why couldn't that kind of work be already underway? For certain activities uh, that WMATA plans to undertake with its economic recovery funds, they have what's called pre-award authority, where the, the activity is eligible for federal reimbursement, and WMATA can go forth and undertake certain work, and at a later date, we will award the grant and obligate it. So they don't have to come first. to you first, they could go and for, start for certain that. For certain undertakings, they can start now, they can create and sustain jobs immediately. But Ms. Liu doesn't indicate that there's any such project that she is uh, performance auditing or pre-auditing, and that's why, what, what I don't understand. Because how long has it been since these funds were? When we, we passed this February, um, I believe it was February 17th, the law was enacted, February 17th. and on March 5th, the Federal Transit Administration issued a notice to our grantees that the funds were available for uh, grants. I see. Well, maybe I am <laughs> overly anxious, <laughs> uh, but it does seem to me that some of that work uh, we're coming on into May could have been started, and I'm a little concerned, even though you, you have until September, I'm sure that it varies. Uh, uh, this WMATA is like a, a, a system with many different kinds of, of uh, infrastructure. Uh, and I take it those grants are grant by grant, uh, not in any one fell swoop? Uh, in, in fact, uh, Congressman Norton, we understand there will probably be two grants. Uh, there are two formula programs under economic, re economic recovery law. And, if they, and, and basically all they need to do is to, is to show you that they can do the job. They're, they're not competing with other, uh, 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 other transit systems, are they, for this no, money? No, they are not. These are formula funds that flow to the Washington, D.C. region, and uh, $202 million of the $214 million in transit funds uh, are directed to WMATA. Well, do you think all of this is going in a timely fashion? From what I observe for 
for WMATA at this time, things are moving in a timely fashion so that they will meet the deadlines for obligating funds. And what's the deadline for obligating funds? Uh, the deadline for obligating half of the funds is September 1, 2009, and 100% of the funds must be obligated by March 5, 2010. And at this moment, WMATA is on schedule. You have no schedule. idea how many funds are obligated as of now? Uh, at this moment, uh, a very small percentage nationwide. There's $8.4 billion in federal transit funding from the economic recovery law. And of that 8.4, uh, about $100 million has been awarded. However, about 20 percent of it, or 25 percent of it, more than a billion and a half, is in process right now. Federal transit grants, uh, the grants we're discussing, uh, require a Department of Labor certification process with the labor unions uh, that are associated with the transit agencies. And that process uh, can take uh, between uh, two weeks and 60 days. So there, we have accounted for that. The reason, one, one reason the highway deadline and the transit deadline uh, differ is because we wanted to take into account and the Congress wanted to take into account that labor certification process. So at this moment, WMATA is on schedule to, to meet the obligation deadlines. All right, I just hope that the internal bureaucracy does not become responsible for any of the delays. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, let, let me follow up on an early line of questioning uh, that, that uh, Ms. Holmes Norton put forward. Uh, Ms. Liu, you know, uh, being on this oversight committee, one of the, one of the problems I've seen, and, and I even saw it before I was on this committee, uh, is the ability or the lack of ability uh, for oversight to keep up when large blocks of money for construction go forward. And I'll give you a couple examples. We had it with the Big Dig, a, bit, a project in Boston where we had a very small oversight community trying to keep up with a huge project. They were just completely outmatched by the contractor community and uh, a lot of money was wasted. I uh, saw it as well. Uh, being part of this committee, uh, did 11 oversight uh, visits to Iraq, uh, reviewing construction projects in Iraq, same thing with Afghanistan. A lot of money spent in a very short amount of time with not enough oversight. We had problems. Now we've got, we've got the dedicated funding issue, which might bring a lot of money. You know, I expect to bring a lot of money in into the system. There will be numerous projects going forward, according to WMATA. And uh, you've got the stimulus, uh, you know, over $200 million. Do you feel comfortable that, that you've got, you said you could always use more people, and I, and I think you're going, you are going to need more people, and we're going to have to, we can't just throw this money out here without, without proper oversight. Uh, what, what do you think? Give me, give me your opinions on what you need and, and what you foresee in terms of a bunch of projects going on. You've got to have inspectors, investigators, auditors, because some of the stuff is in-house and it's contractual in nature, not to mention the physical uh, monitoring and inspection that needs to go on. Uh, how, is, how is this all going to happen? Uh, reassure me, please. Well, you raise a very good question. Um, I definitely could use more resources. Uh, I, I currently uh, have a budget about uh, $3.7 million. Uh, I have 23 people on board, and I'm authorized uh, 29. What's the breakdown of the folks you have on board? What are, what are they? I have, uh, I think I have, eight, I have 18, uh, 18 auditors uh, and three investigators, and my secretary and myself, that would be a total of 23 right now. Uh, we hope to bring in uh, three entry-level individuals um, sometime in the uh, June-July time frame. Um, but you're right, we, we have a huge influx of federal funds coming in now with the uh, potential um, $150 million in the dedicated funding and then you got the, uh, the uh, $202 million in the, uh, in the Recovery Act funds. And my experience in the federal government has been, I'm a retired federal employee, and my experience in the government is that uh, the potential of fraud, waste, and abuse is very great, it's heightened when you have that, uh, when you have new influx of money. You know, we saw what happened in Iraq, you saw what happened in, uh, with uh, Hurricane Katrina. So I am concerned as to whether I have sufficient resources to address the uh, audit needs as well as the investigative needs. Um, as I told Congressman Norton, we give the highest priority to um, the stimulus money that's, uh, that uh, we'll be getting. 
And we do do these contract attestations. And it's contract attestations is our front end work, uh, where we go through these proposals, look at their pricing, look at the costs uh, on claims, uh, and see if that's a reasonable amount or as opposed to them bleeding the government. Uh, we also have a role in terms of also source procurements. We do that contract attestation. We also, um, you know, the, the Recovery Act encourages uh, Buy American. But there might be things where there is no um, American manufacturing, we have to go foreign. We have a role to uh, do pre-award certifications to make sure that there's a certain amount of domestic uh, input in putting together the, uh, the, the final product. And that, our office does do that. But when it comes to contracts, um, we try to do select contracts uh, to make sure that the terms of the contract are being met and we are getting what we paid for. And, 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 and not, not to interrupt you, but that, that requires folks to go out on the job. Yes. Uh, you can only do so much auditing. It's sort of what the defense uh, contracting audit agency had a problem with, where they, had, they were auditing the construction in Iraq from Alexandria, Virginia. And, and uh, we didn't have auditors on the ground right. uh, for the longest time, first couple of years in, in Iraq, and it was a mess. So I'm just uh, I'm very concerned about having worked on job sites uh, for about 20 years. I'm just concerned about your ability to be out there on the ground. Uh, it doesn't sound like you're set up for it now. Yeah, well, well that's very true. Um, we don't audit from our desks. Uh, we have to get out to the field. Uh, when you do this contract attestation work, you have to do that. I have a, I have a team of two that's going out to um, Manitoba, Canada uh, next week to do the post-delivery certification on the Buy America uh, mm. to see if they met Buy America requirements because the buses uh, are being purchased by New Flyer, which is a Canadian firm. It's being assembled in Minnesota, and so our audit team is going to be going to Minnesota as well. But yeah. it takes resources to do the travel and also having the resources to go out there and, and it takes time to do that type of work. Yeah, um, I understand. Well, we, we, need to, we need to stay uh, in the loop here. If, you, if you, need, you need more people, this is an important part of this. Uh, you're going to save us money by doing your job. And you also know that the appetite for for expenditures and, and appetite for appropriations is going to diminish greatly if we start to see waste, fraud, and abuse. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's just uh, leaving yourself wide open for criticism. We don't want that to happen. I just want to make one point, Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, unlike my counterparts in the uh, federal IG community, we, didn't, we at the state and local level did not get any money to do our audits and do our investigations uh, relating to the, um, the Recovery Act. Uh, funds. That, well, so that's, we, a, that's a terrible uh, lapse on our part. Uh, I wish I had known that up front. Uh, I certainly appreciate the value of your service and I want you to be able to do your job. You're going to be the first one in line for criticism when things go wrong, so I think it, it behooves us to give you, well, you might not be first, we might be first, you'll be right behind us. And we'll have folks up here blaming you. Uh, uh, Mr. Welby, let me shift to you just for a second. You, you, you offer a great uh, perspective nationally because you're dealing with <clears throat> a number of, uh, of these larger uh, transit authorities. So you have a, you have a sense that I don't uh, of, of how uh, in Washington, D.C., we, we compare with other systems of relatively the same size. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's your assessment on how we're doing here in terms of uh, preparing for this uh, <clears throat> sizable increase in, in expenditures, uh, increase in the number of projects, you know, the complexity of this stuff? How, how are we sizing up here? I think the region is, and, and WMATA has, have taken some important actions at, at the Federal Transit Administration uh, we have put together uh, really a risk strategy and an oversight strategy associated with the ARA funds. And we have in place, of, of the $8.4 billion in ARA funds for transit, uh, about 99% of it flows into existing FTA programs where we have an oversight system in place. 
So we do financial management oversight reviews. Uh, for our projects, for the large capital projects, when they're under construction, we have uh, project management oversight engineers who are boots on the ground who uh, visit with the grantees, visit the projects, and uh, make sure the project is on schedule and on budget. And we have, uh, in fact, a meeting with WMATA next week, our quarterly meeting, uh, to talk about, among other things, those major capital projects. So WMATA's history of managing major capital projects um, has, has fared relatively well. Uh, the most recent uh, significant project, uh, the Largo Metro Rail Extension, um, was brought in uh, on time and on budget. And there are uh, other large projects, such as the Wheelie Avenue Metro Rail Extension, which we now have underway. The Airport Authority is constructing that project. Uh, WMATA will be the owner and operator, ultimately. But uh, Metro has uh, a, a sound track record in that regard. There are uh, certain reviews we have done uh, recently where we do have uh, open findings uh, that we are working with Metro to close out. Um, many of them parallel uh, those that Inspector General Liu has identified, uh, but we are working to uh, address those findings. Uh, Ms. Holmes, do you have any follow-up uh, questions? No further questions, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, let me ask you, you know, I offered the same opportunity to the previous panel. Uh, are, there, are there aspects of uh, your situation now going forward, you know, uh, overseeing WMATA that, that we haven't uh, touched upon here that you think is important for the committee to hear? Uh, Ms. Liu? Oh, we certainly are uh, supportive of the uh, dedicated funding bill that would give us uh, statutory authority within uh, the uh, compact jurisdiction. I think that will strengthen uh, our ability to deal with any challenges uh, that we get from the people that we audit, uh, both internal and, 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 and both internal and external. Just, just to to sort of amplify a point, I want to make. Uh, this is an oversight committee. You're both doing oversight work. There's a natural alliance here that we have. We want to see the work done efficiently. We want to see the taxpayer money used efficiently, effectively. Uh, so, but but if we don't know the problems you're you're uh, encountering, and it looks like we missed an opportunity to fortify the oversight apparatus uh, in, in this case, you know, I'm going to look for an opportunity to, to correct that. Uh, I think there will be vehicles where we can do that. But we, we've got to have the oversight in place. Otherwise, we're going to have a mess on our hands. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the, the, the rail system. Uh, FTA does have a better oversight uh, uh, protocol in place. I've seen that over and over again. Uh, work out better than my heavy highway projects where we don't nearly have, uh, you know, the oversight that, that's necessary. So that, that's encouraging. But still, I think that with the uh, drastic increase that we're going to see here in activity, there, there needs to be a sizable uh, increase in, in com commensurate in increase in o oversight ability here. And I don't think we have it. So uh, it's just a red flag for me, and, and I want to try to address that at some point, but it's going to require communications between uh, both of you and, and the committee, the subcommittee especially. Okay? okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Welby's, do you want to address any, anything that you, you haven't uh, addressed so far? I think I would just amplify uh, two points. One is, as you've noted, with the economic recovery funds, uh, by, by doubling the resources, the federal resources that will flow to WMATA in the coming year, um, there's an increased risk. And the risk for our large grantees involves uh, taking on multiple projects uh, that would have been spread out over a longer period of time simultaneously. So the capacity constraints that you've described uh, with regard to our oversight resources certainly apply to the resources of our grantees like WMATA in implementing multiple projects simultaneously. Uh, the engineer or financial expert who usually would handle X number of projects will be handling X plus Y number of projects. And, uh, that's, that's an area that we are going to be focused on going forward. We are enhancing some of our oversight tools uh, to include additional scrutiny of the economic recovery resources. In particular, uh, we are structuring some of our project management oversight and uh, financial management oversight to account for uh, that increased flow of funds. And then the second point is one that, that we have discussed already, but it is uh, sort of the state of good repair needs 
uh, at systems like WMATA. And over time, um, that caseload, that, that reinvestment need only grows. And so it's important to start making headway on it uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, there are uh, risks that increase as that reinvestment need grows. I know in the reauthorization of safety, uh, we will be paying attention to that. And there is a discussion about how state of good repair can be addressed, but uh, it has uh, parallel oversight implications as well. Well, let me, you know, you invite a question. I, I, I understand uh, Ms. Liu's statement that we did not, we in Congress did not uh, adequately fund or, or, or fund at all the enhanced oversight that's necessary for her and her team to do their job. What about FTA? How did we, did we do any enhancement there? For FTA's uh, regular statutory program, uh, there are takedowns that are uh, three quarters of a percent or one percent for large capital projects. And that provides us with a resource that we can apply to the ARA funds as well. Uh, Congress did include in the statute uh, a set aside for FTA oversight uh, equivalent to about a third of a percent. So it's uh, really about a third of what we would usually see for uh, our oversight resources for, for, this, for this size funding. So for the $8.4 billion, uh, we would usually see uh, additional resources compared to what was in ARA for our usual program. And they're, they're, you know, we are where we are. We're working to maximize um, our efficiency using that, that resource right now. Okay, and again, I, I, we, the, com the subcommittee and the, and the committee uh, welcomes your, your assessment as we go forward. I think you'll, you'll be able to uh, sense whether or not uh, that one-third of one percent is going to be nearly adequate. Okay. Uh, seeing no further uh, questions, I want to thank you both for your willingness to come before the committee and help us with our work. I thought it was very helpful, very enlightening, to, especially for me to understand what, what you're dealing with. I'm encouraged, but like I said, I got some red flags out there I'm a little concerned a bit with, but uh, I want to thank you for your testimony here, and I bid you good day. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you. If we could have the next panel. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, as I have said previously, it is the subcommittee's policy that all witnesses must be sworn in. So I invite you to please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony that you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, let the record indicate that the witnesses of all, each of the three have answered in the affirmative. Your witness, your witness testimony as written will be submitted into the record uh, without objection, so you don't have to worry about uh, reciting every, every bit of it. Uh, we ask you to summarize your, your testimony uh, within the five-minute limitations. Before I begin with witness testimony, I'm going to just do a brief introduction of our, our three panelists. Uh, Mr. Craig Simpson is a representative of the Amalgamated Transit Union, ATU Local 689. Mr. Simpson served as a bus operator for WMATA in 1974. He was elected ATU Local 689 shop steward uh, of the Northern Bus Division in 1983 and was appointed assistant business agent for ATU Local 689 in 1989. In 1993, Mr. Simpson was appointed to fill an ex unexpired term of Secretary Treasurer of the Union and later elected, was elected to two full terms. He subsequently engaged in contract work for Progressive Maryland, Metropolitan Washington Council, AFL-CIO, and ATU Local 689. His current contract with ATU Local 689 as political and legislative representative began in 
February of 2009. Ms. Diana Zinkel is chair for the Riders Advisory Council for Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. She presides over WMATA board and staff on issues affecting riders and provides recommendations to the board and the authority on how to improve operations. Ms. Zinkel also serves as an analyst for the Government Accountability Office. Her engagements at GAO include a wide variety of, is of issues, including intercity passenger rail restructuring. Mr. Ben Ross serves as president of the Action Committee for Transit, which advocates for public transit and transit-oriented land use in Montgomery County, Maryland. There he helped build a 30-member group into a significant force in, account in county affairs with over 600 paid members and nearly 100 active volunteers. Mr. Ross is also the chair of the Transit First Group, a coalition of transit riders, environmental and labor groups organized to oppose cuts in WMATA funding and service. I welcome each of you and I, I thank you in advance for your willingness to offer testimony before the committee. I'll begin with the customary uh, five minutes and uh, please be aware of the uh, little box in front of you with the lights. I'm sure you were able to observe the previous panel. Uh, Mr. Simpson, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, skip over a lot of my testimony and really get to the heart of an issue that's been before the subcommittee before, and that is the way that WMATA is funded. And I believe the way that it's funded drives some of the problems at WMATA. It's up to, at least fairly recently, uh, largely been an obligation-based, where each uh, local jurisdiction um, says that they will pay its share of the WMATA costs um, out of their general funds. There are some exceptions, but that's generally the way it's funded. And with a multitude of jurisdictions, uh, you have the state of Maryland, uh, the District of Columbia, and in Northern Virginia, um, in, the, in the transit zone, there are a number of local jurisdictions that actually fund WMATA uh, counties and, and cities. So each one of them uh, facing different tax bases, different budget priorities, uh, have different interests in funding WMATA at any given time, and different abilities at any given time. And I believe that drives some of the problems. Uh, one of the topics of this hearing was uh, its effect on existing operations. And my criticism of the WMATA board is its parochialism in this instance. Um, when they r realized that they had a budget problem, the way they dealt with it was not to look at it from a regional perspective. Um, they left the rail untouched, not saying that's a bad decision, but they left it untouched. And what they said was, we're going to um, look at the bus service, including regional bus service, lines that have been designated as regionally important with that fall within our individual jurisdictions, and we're going to make a decision on what of those to cut. Uh, so the cuts fell very unevenly. Some jurisdictions uh, came up with the money to cover their share of the deficits. Uh, others came up with some money. Uh, Maryland, uh, where the most severe cuts are made, it's uh, of the of the 13.6 million or so in, in remaining deficit, almost 10 million of the bus cuts are in Maryland, uh, and including many on major regional routes that serve federal facilities. Um, the decision making there, I think, is what I fault as much as the financing, but I think it's not driven by any individual um, board member. My criticism is not of them as an individual, but as the um, underlying funding mechanism, I think, drives that decision. So uh, that's manifested in a number of different, different ways. Uh, there's been a de-evolution of, of kind of WMATA as the uh, uh, regional planner for transportation in the area. And uh, most of the, well, in fact, all of the new proposed rail projects are really locally driven projects without any, uh, well, I, I mean, there is a regional transportation planning board that acts, in, in my opinion, more of a clearinghouse than an actual planning board. And where WMATA's role previously had been to plan these um, uh, projects, they're being driven by local decisions, some of which may or may not be um, uh, true regional priorities. Uh, improving bus service, uh, same thing has happened. It's continually put on the back burner, and yet um, we could make existing improvements in bus service if we, if regional bus service, if we weren't um, driven by local decision making. Uh, and that's also true in undercapitalization of rail, uh, undercapitalization of the bus system, and with metro access. Uh, none of these things are, are really adequately funded 
mostly because of, um, this, I believe, the situation we discussed before. I think that there is a model going forward when we talk about dedicated funding. And uh, it's very difficult to uh, impose, uh, there's been the idea of, a, of imposing a region-wide sales tax. It's very difficult to do with the local jurisdictions because it impacts them differently. So acting in their own individual interest, uh, some will favor it, some will oppose it. The same is true with other region-wide taxes that could potentially be looked at. But I think the, uh, both the Metro Matters Financing Agreement and the uh, current proposal that, that hopefully will, the District of Columbia will take care of its compact amendments and hopefully Congress will appropriate the funds, I think those type of financing agreements may provide the model for st stabilizing uh, uh, financing of WMATA, where you have a specified financial target and the local jurisdictions dedicate funds that they choose to meet that financing goal. And that may be a more practical way to stabilize WMATA's um, financing over, over time. Now, the agreements that I've referenced only apply to capital funding currently and not all capital funding. Um, but certainly, it may provide a model for extending that to operating funds. So I uh, just want to, as a long-term solution, uh, put that forth. I think the federal role, um, and, and I, I guess I differ somewhat than, than some other people, and that I welcome a federal role on the WMATA board. Uh, I think it will provide a good counterbalance to the local jurisdiction's interest. The federal government has a regional interest with facilities throughout the area. It has an interest in making sure that there's adequate transportation of those facilities. And I think in partnership with the local jurisdictions, it can help to strengthen the regional system. So I welcome the federal participation and, and, and look forward to, uh, uh, to that taking place. Uh, I hope that over time, uh, that partnership can be expanded further. I think that this is a critical system for the federal government, and I think uh, uh, the investment in it will, will ultimately be worthwhile. The federal government does have a special relationship, obviously, uh, uh, with the District of Columbia, which it, which it is ultimately responsible for, and also with uh, this being the nation's capital, its major federal facilities located in the suburban areas as well. So uh, with that, I'll conclude my testimony and um, uh, open it for any questions afterward. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Schenkel, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Lynch, um, for inviting me to testify today. My name is Diana Zinkel, and I am the 2009 chair of the WMATA Riders Advisory Council. It is an honor for me to be here today representing the RAC and riders of public transit throughout the national capital region. A list of the names and jurisdictional affiliations of the other members of the RAC is included at the end of my written statement. The board of WMATA authorized the RAC in 2005 following public request to create a citizen's advisory group to serve as an institutionalized voice for riders within the authority. Um, all of us are volunteers, and actually several RAC members were here earlier today. Um, Dr. Kelsey Brackmort, who is actually an employee of the Congressional Research Service. Um, my jurisdictional vice chair from Maryland, um, Patrick Sheehan, who is also chair of WMATA's Accessibility Advisory. Um, committee and um, Carl Seep. Um, he's a student right now at American University, and he had to get to class. Um, so they did. They did make an effort to stop in, and I was very glad to get a chance to see them today. We only meet once a month, so it was you know we don't get to see each other too often. Um, all of uh, the RAC members are committed transit riders, some of us by choice, some of us because driving is not an option for us. Six of us are car free. We use bus, rail, and metro access. We walk and we bike. I myself have never owned a car. I've used transit my whole life, in large part because my own mother could not hold a driver's license. She was transit dependent, and when my dad was at work, that meant we were too. We weren't the only ones. Lots of folks in my hometown of Green Bay, Wisconsin, used and needed the bus. And many of those bus routes that I used to take back in the 70s and the 80s actually are still there today in Green Bay, exactly where they were. Um, another community, actually, with excellent bus service um, is Honolulu, which is where my mother went to high school. And when we used to visit my grandparents in the 80s and the 90s, a lot of the buses that she took in the 50s were still there. Um, so I learned how to live a transit-oriented life from my mom, and I find it a rewarding experience to, to, rewarding to experience my community um, by foot, by bike, by bus and rail, and all RIC members um, do feel the same. Um, I there are four points I would like to make today in my 
in my oral statement. Um, first, WMATA provides basic transportation to residents of the National Capital Region. It is central to how many residents of the region live, work, and play. It, ser it also serves visitors from all over the nation and the world. For transit-dependent individuals, WMATA is a lifeline to jobs, medical appointments, religious services, and groceries. It prevents drunk and tired driving and keeps the region moving in inclement, in inclement weather. Two, RAC members are very supportive of recent and anticipated changes to improve bus service. For instance, um, the uh, new hybrid buses, smart trip readers on all buses, the next bus program, and the bus priority corridor network. And let me just take a moment to say what an honor it was, I think, for everyone involved in WMATA to have Vice President, the Vice President visit the bus facility in Landover, Maryland last, last week, acknowledging um, WMATA's new bus programs. We hope this, um, this type of support signals renewed commitment to existing expanded bus service. This is the type of commitment that is needed to support reliance on bus service and generate development around bus lines similar to the development that you see around rail lines. And you do see that kind of support in some communities for bus service. Um, my third point today is that RAC members are a bit concerned that the pace of some of the recent operational changes um, in WMATA may be too fast for some riders, particularly transit-dependent vulnerable populations. We feel that WMATA and the public would benefit from earlier and more meaningful opportunity for public input into such changes. For example, the elimination of paper transfers is one example. Um, this was done through a budget process with little opportunity for public input um, before the decision was made. We, WMATA came to us, to the RAC, to ask how to best publicize the elimination of paper transfers, but we really were not afforded an opportunity, nor was the general public afforded an opportunity to have input um, into that decision. Um, similarly, we are also concerned at the RAC about the fate of weekly passes. Um, weekly bus passes are something that many bus riders rely on quite a bit. Um, and when I lived in Boston, I would have my monthly rail or bus pass every month, and it gave me a lot of freedom and really helped um, my budget at a time when I was young and just starting out and not making very much money working in the private, public sector. My fourth point is that RAC members would like to see WMATA achieve a stable funding situation, both from a capital and operational standpoint. In conclusion, I was very glad to hear just a few minutes ago that you're a regular rider of both Metro and the T. I was always a big fan of the T when I lived in Boston, as I just said. And I would say that further information about the RAC, including meeting minutes, handouts, and bylaws, can be found on our webpage on the WMATA website. I would also like to thank all the members of the RAC, everyone at WMATA, my family, my coworkers at GAO, who have been very tolerant for the past few weeks, and all my friends and neighbors for their advice and support. And finally, I would like to thank the subcommittee for this opportunity to speak, and I'm ha happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Zinkel. Mr. Rash, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to give you a rider's view of Metro. Uh, I'm going to focus on the root causes, try to focus on the root causes of these financial problems that we've been talking about this morning. Um, and I'll start off with a take-home message. There's a conventional wisdom out there that says that highway projects are supported by user fees while transit is subsidized. And that's really no longer true. In my written testimony, I compared Metro's funding to the total... I'm sorry, Mr. Yes. Ross, I missed that. Yes. I missed that. Repeat that point again. Yes. There's a conventional wisdom that highway projects are supported by user fees while transit is subsidized. Uh -huh. And okay. I don't think that's true anymore. Okay. Uh, and I did an analysis in my written testimony uh, comparing Metro's funding sources with the total of all of Maryland's state highway programs. Uh, what I found was that riders are paying 32 percent of Metro costs, that's uh, capital plus operating and including the Dulles Rail Project, and the drivers are paying for only 20 percent of the highway program. Uh, now, this is a deeply tr rooted trend. It's not just in Maryland. I'm sure if I looked at other states, I would get similar numbers. And at the federal level, you see the uh, highway trust fund that used to be flush with money is now borrowing from the general fund. <coughs> uh, and the state and federal transportation budgets are being squeezed by this decline in revenue from road users. And Metro is caught in that squeeze, and I think that's really the underlying reason that we're threatened with loss of service. Um, <clears throat> I think people have been 
talking at hearings and this morning about the hardships that are going to be caused by some of these cuts. And it's especially true in Washington, well, it's the same in Boston, that housing is very expensive and you can really do bad things to a family budget if you're forced to buy a car when you didn't need one. <clears throat> now, as people have also said, these cuts are coming at a time when more people are riding transit. Uh, metro ridership is up 42 percent in 10 years. Uh, in the last few months, it's still going up, even though the price of gas has come back down and we've got a bad economy. And uh, that's happening, and I think uh, Congressman Bilbray had some very good things to say about that, which is that Metro has become a way to live, not just to commute. And it, the ridership is growing fastest for non-work travel. Uh, in a period of eight years, the morning rush hour travel was up 33 percent, uh, but Saturday ridership was up 47 percent and 57 percent on Sundays. And you see all these um, uh, new communities, U Street, Columbia Heights, Clarendon, Silver Spring, Hyattsville. Uh, one thing that struck me was that at Columbia Heights, metro ridership went up 70 percent in just four years. Now, the spending pro priorities of, at all levels of government have not kept up with the shift in public preferences. Uh, in this area, we've got less driving, and yet we've had a series of big road construction projects on both sides of the Potomac, while rail to Dulles is just getting started, and the new Purple Line in Maryland is still being planned. And this, I think, is the root cause of Metro's funding problems. Uh, people are no longer so taken with driving. You know, we still drive a lot, but it's just a way to get where we want to go. It's not uh, something we're excited about. Uh, years ago, they were building parkways for something called pleasure driving, and nobody today would say driving on the beltway is a pleasure. Uh, <clears throat> and the effect of this change in public attitudes is a, lack, a loss of willingness to pay taxes for driving. Uh, in this area, the gas tax has not gone up since 1992. Uh, <clears throat> and that's squeezing the entire uh, transportation budget at all levels. And the net effect is, uh, after a series of pass-throughs, that metro riders are being hit for money to fill the gaps uh, that are caused by lack of willingness to pay for roads. Uh, and really, the public has spoken for a shift in priorities from roads to transit. Really, it's spoken twice, once with its feet by riding and once with its votes by not wanting to pay for gas taxes. And the political system really needs to start to listen and reassess our priorities and put transit first. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me ask a question, uh, repeat a question that Mr. Simpson raised, and I want to ask uh, Ms. Zenkel and Mr. Ross to respond to it. Uh, Mr. Simpson made the point that uh, in this recent restructuring and cost-cutting exercise that, that rail was basically held harmless and, and bus ridership, well, the bus routes took the hit. Is that, that fair? That's correct. Statement of what you what you said, uh, I suspect. And, and I, look, I'm, I'm I'm no expert. Uh, that's why we have you here. Uh, but I would think that with the fixed system, transit system, it's tougher to squeeze uh, savings out of out of rail um, than it is to. Well, look at it this way. There's, there's no replacement for the rail, for, for the trains, uh, you know, principally. But, but if the bus isn't there, I suppose you could take your car and uh, go to a rail station. And so there's somewhat of a, a replacement there, uh, easier than saying uh, an alternative to, to the train. Um, train's probably a lot more attractive. Uh, I, I know most people where I come from love the train, hate the bus. Uh, because buses, ha unfortunately, have to travel in traffic unless there's a really good dedicated bus route that they, they can use. What do you think, Ms. Zenkel, in terms of uh, uh, ha has, has, you know, the bus, bus routes, have they taken the hit? What are you hearing from your members about uh, the proposed cuts in, in uh, services of these bus lines? A lot of them in, 
you know, Montgomery County, uh, Maryland, and, and elsewhere, as, as Mr. Van Hollen was, was stating earlier today. What's your read on that? Well, um, our members did have some personal experience um, with some of the bus routes that have been proposed for either elimination or reduction in frequency. We also attended, there was at least one RAC member at every one of the recent public hearings. We've also gotten some public comments. These bus routes are very important to the people who, who live near them. And while there is indications that some of the routes um, may not have as much ridership as we would like to see. They, we've also gotten some, I guess what you would call qualitative feedback that some of the quantitative information that those decisions were based on may not have been um, as accurate as one may have liked. Um, part of what came out of the public hearing process, I think, is that some of these routes may be a little bit more heavily used than, than we had actually believed, um, and certainly as the, RA, the RAC understands that essentially WMATA has to have a balanced budget and that some reduction in service may be necessary in order to balance the budget, we may not be able to come up with a completely blind set of reductions from the standpoint, from the view of the public, something that's seamless. However, what we would like to see is reduction in frequencies, headway lengthenings, if, if absolutely necessary to make changes in service, cuts that result in less frequent service as opposed to complete elimination of routes. When you completely eliminate a route, you are taking a lifeline away from folks who may not have any other alternative. And unfortunately, many of the eliminations were in places where that was really you know, these aren't routes in central D.C. They're out on the more of the, the urban fringe in Prince George's County, out in Arlington, and there you don't have the density of routes in those areas that you do um, here, you know, actually inside the Beltway. And we're very concerned about any route elimination. Okay. Uh, Mr. Rosh, you have anything you want to add before I go back to Mr. Simpson and allow him to rebut? Yeah, I, I think that uh, the process, which was naturally political and should be, uh, that uh, came up with these proposals reflects reality. It's, it's that the rail system ha it has tremendous, enormous support from the public, and, it's some, and that's because it's something that serves uh, all income levels. You know, it's like Social Security is always people have resisted cuts in Congress where programs that are means tested get cut. And I think that it is uh, a sign that when you put in a good quality of transit, it gets an enormous level of public support. And uh, bus service is an essential part of transit, and the hope has got to be that as you upgrade the bus service, you make it attractive to more people, it will attract more public support, and that making it a higher quality of service will actually benefit all income levels because you have something that has that public support and maintains its political strength. Great. Um, Mr. Simpson, just let me preface this by saying, you know, I, I think you had a very thoughtful testimony. Um, and I think you're right. I, I, think, I think, you know, the easy thing, uh, the easiest thing, the path of least resistance probably was, was looking at the bus routes. Uh, but a couple of things that you mentioned in, in your, your testimony. One is that some of these bus routes actually serve some pretty vital federal uh, facilities, which, you know, concerns me, you know, from an operational aspect for our government. Uh, and also, uh, as I have been able to travel around the district in Northern Virginia and Maryland, uh, y we have had a pattern of development of public housing. I grew up in public housing. I uh, lived there for 15 years, and I noticed that unlike uh, in the city of Boston, the public housing developments are right downtown or in the inner city. Uh, so we, you know, most of the, all of the inner city neighborhoods, uh, you know, you got some struggling neighborhoods, uh, heavy minority populations there, who are nevertheless by the T connected to the jobs. Here, the connector and the feeder uh, for folks living in these developments that are not out in the, well, to me they seem like they're out in the boonies. But here it's just sort of how the, 
you know, you get a lot of farmland here and people, there's an abundance of land, so some of these major housing developments have been located outside the city center. Uh, and so you got to serve those minority neighborhoods. They, they need, you know, those families uh, need to be connected to the job base. And the, the feeder system to get those folks connected to the jobs is, is really, in large part, the bus system uh, to feed them into the rail. So um, how, how, do we, how do we tackle that, that issue in terms of, and, and I know, you know part of it, look, you're a union rep. Uh, I was a union president with the iron workers. My job was to put my people to work. That was my job. And I'm sure that you're looking at this uh, in part of a reduction in the number of members your, your local is going to need in terms of driving buses. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a valid concern. That's a valid concern. That's, that's a real concern and one that I, I respect. Uh, how, do we, how do we look at this, uh, this whole need for greater efficiency and, and maybe, as Ms. Zinkel uh, suggested, not, not, not eliminating the route, but maybe it's the frequency and timing of, of the buses coming into the station, the, the hours of service that we, we operate. Uh, can we gain greater efficiencies uh, and, and, and those variables as opposed to eliminating the whole route and then leaving those folks uh, stranded basically uh, you know without public transportation and, and, and eliminating your your members jobs what are you thinking on that well I think that um, in terms of efficiencies I think there are uh, a lot of opportunities for bus efficiencies and it's in fact one of the proposals we made to WMATA was to essentially put some money, accelerate their bus priority uh, and, and, and BRT-like proposals to increase bus speeds and you actually save costs. And uh, just a simple example of that is uh, in my testimony where if you're running a bus, if you have a 35 minute from one end of the line to the other, you need four buses to maintain a 10 minute headway if congestion increases to the point where you have five minutes more running time, you have to add a bus into that in order to maintain that 10 minute headway. And adding that one bus, that's a 25% increase in cost. Um, I think you can by using um, bus priority measures and by equalization, uh, in other words, using limited stop service or express service to equalize the load across the line, actually reduce costs uh, and by, limit, by taking a bus off the line, but providing the same level of service. And even though that may seem like it costs a job, it makes us more productive, it makes the service better, it attracts increased ridership, and ultimately leads to service expansion. So I'm not opposed to that, I actually favor that. And I think that's one of the ways that WMATA could address this. Their proposals, just to clarify, the heart of a lot of their proposals to reduce service aren't on I mean, there are some fringe lines that are included, don't get me wrong, but if you look at the amounts of money, where they're saving the money, it's on the heaviest hauling lines that they're proposing to reduce service. And they're in primarily, um, as you indicated, minority and working class neighborhoods. Uh, just two examples, the C4 on University Boulevard in suburban Maryland, uh, that's the heart of the Latino community. Uh, these same people. Uh, people that live in that area use the Q2 on Beers Mill Road to access uh, um, um, Rockville, downtown Rockville. Uh, those are the two heaviest hauling lines in Maryland. Those are proposed for truncation and reduction of service. And on those types of lines, you can gain those type of savings just by reordering your service. I have to confess, I, I have not been to any of the meetings or, or hearings that they've had on, on cessation of service and eliminating these bus lines. Ha, has the analysis that you described in terms of, you know, spreading out the time, maybe instead of, you know, every five minutes, every ten minutes or seven and a half minutes, whatever, whatever it is, has that analysis been part of the, uh, the process uh, up to now or are we just looking at, I know no. they're trying to get rid of a lot of overhead so they're, they're using broad strokes here, but I just don't know if they've been listening closely enough. I mean, no, the proposal was mainly uh, monetary driven. It wasn't driven by any uh, plan, and that's part of what I argue. I mean, there are some funds that WMATA could do to bridge the gap until you had time to really examine these lines to find out where, you know, how to structure it so you could get the savings. Uh, 
the, the use of federal stimulus money is obviously one way that they could bridge the current gap. There mm -hmm. are others. They have uh, an operating reserve that they could use. Uh, the jurisdictions have uh, new projects. I mean, my view is that you should protect, protect your existing services and, and projects uh, first before you uh, uh, build new things. And you could, I'm not saying you don't build the new things, but you could certainly slow down uh, that and transfer monies to, the, to protect your existing services. So there's at least three immediate ways that WMATA could bridge this gap while they begin to look at more efficient ways to provide bus service. As you probably heard, uh, they're calling me for votes again, I believe. Uh, I think we're close enough to the end, and I could throw my running shoes on and I, we, so we could spend a little bit of time here, uh, at least 10 more minutes, uh, 10 to 15 more minutes uh, before I have to run out. But as with the other two panels, uh, I'm sure my questioning was not exhaustive or, or nearly adequate to cover all the issues that we have in front of us. So what I'd like to do is, uh, starting with Ms. Zinkel, uh, are there issues that, that you'd like to uh, bring to the attention of the committee that have not been asked of you, or is there some earlier point that you really want to amplify in terms of making sure we understand uh, the feelings of the members of your organization? Um, I would I would say, first of all, um, if it was not apparent from my earlier statement, we are, um, we are very supportive of improvements to bus service. WMATA has experienced considerable improvements over in recent years to the rail service, and we believe that's benefited everyone in the region. And we're very much looking forward to seeing similar types of improvement to bus service. What's a bit disheartening is that we are seeing the current bus system adjusted through a budget process right now. Not necessarily because these routes aren't uh, soliciting the level of ridership needed to warrant having a bus, but simply because a combination of budgeting issues means that there's a shortfall and jurisdictions weren't necessarily willing to put the money on the table to to meet that shortfall. Yeah. Um, in addition, as I have said in many fora before, and I'm sure everyone is getting tired of hearing me say this, but I will reemphasize in terms of the process we went through this year with the 2010 budget, the public did not have a budget document as we have normally had in the past. And that has limited the ability for the public to participate in the WMATA budget process. Of course, as a citizens advisory group, our primary message has to be that public participation is really the key to making WMATA the best ride in the nation and keeping it the best ride in the nation. So I would hope that perhaps we've learned some lessons through this process and we can continue to engage the public or increase engagement by the general public in WMATA decision making in the future, especially early public input. Uh, thank you. I, and, I, and I do, you know, I, I did hear, uh, Mr. Simpson, you know, your, your criticism of the balkanized system, uh, no, no offense intended to the Balkans, but the system we've got here, uh, well, pre-existing, now, now that we're going to have, you know, some federal presence on these boards, maybe it stops some of the parochial stuff with the dedicated uh, resources here that have been projected, maybe that does address some, some of the issues. But I think there's still a need to make sure that there's some equity in this whole process. And it's not just a budget exercise to the detriment of uh, some of the poorer communities and some of the working class communities that really need the service. Mr. Ross. Yeah, <clears throat> I make two points. One is I'd like to uh, agree with Mr. Simpson about the uh, division. And you can see the effect very clearly. Uh, Maryland, the bus service used to be funded separately by Montgomery and Prince George's counties. And there, were, they, there was only one bus route that connected the two counties. Uh, since they added, since the state took over the funding in both counties 15 years ago, we've had three cross-county bus routes added, and they've all been very successful. Um, <clears throat> second point is something that Mr. Cato's talked about that is the coming need to do something about overcrowding of the downtown metro system, the core capacity, 
as it fills up and eight car trains aren't enough. Uh, that again is a regional problem because you need capacity in downtown to handle the people coming in from Maryland and Virginia and it's also a, fin a big financial problem and I think it's really important that we get on top of these system preservation funding issues quickly because there's going to be a large demand for funding coming down the pike first for the purple line in Maryland and then even bigger for the core capacity. Now those are very astute observations. Mr. Simpson, I'm going to allow you to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I did want to make one other point. It's more of a long-term point, and that is uh, hopefully that the, the federal role will be, will be able to see this better, and, and your committee will, will be able to uh, oversee it as well. Uh, the federal government, as well as jurisdictions, have put a lot of money into building up the infrastructure of WMATA. And um, what's happening now with um, rail expansion projects is they're essentially locally driven. Uh, they're probably in fact, they will make application for federal funds. Um, but the, the way that these projects are moving forward, they're not being looked at from a regional perspective, and they're not really looking at how do they integrate with the existing WMATA system. And not to belabor the point, but I think that the federal role could be crucial both in utilizing the existing funds that you've put into it. Uh, WMATA has two heavy overhaul shops and a third one that's currently uh, not utilized, that I'm not saying you automatically put, put, you know, merge the systems, but at least the discussions ought to take place on how do we capitalize on what we've already done to lower the costs on any of these expansion projects. So I would once again welcome a federal role, uh, both through your committee and through the WMATA board in examining those type of regional expansion issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in, in closing, I just want to say we have an, we have a, an open dialogue here. Uh, so we appreciate the, the valuable perspectives that you each have because it reflects the workers and the people who use the system. Uh, and so it would help the committee greatly, I think, if before we see something bad happen, we get, we get some information in and maybe we can prevent that. Uh, we can have greater scrutiny on, on some of these decisions that might be, might be being made in a vacuum without due consideration to the communities that are affected, to the workers that are affected, uh, and, and just the, the overall health of the system and how it works. So, uh, you know, feel free. We have an open door here. We, we, we hear your, your, your uh, concerns and, and would like to, uh, to the degree possible, impact some of these changes so that, uh, you know, those concerns are addressed, okay? Uh, again, I thank you for your willingness to come here and, and to help the committee with this work, and I bid you good day. Thank you.